you see that right there coming at you in your face in the real in the raw in the moment all the way alive baby that is the trademark of quality right there ttt baby tent talks tunes with my special brand new camera yay let me reach on over here to the monitor the monitor being my desktop computer which is the way it should be and let's see if I am indeed actually going out L-I-V-E on the F-B. Hmm? I can stare right at the camera and scroll down and out of my peripheral vision see that, yes, indeed, I am on live. And people are looking at me right now, live. Let us maximize the screen and expand it. Hmm, apparently it says I'm on, it says Tent Talks Tunes 10-26-22. I don't know why. Today is November 16th, 2022. And as James Pogo says, welcome back. Your dreams were your ticket out. Welcome back. Yes, thank you, James, for welcoming me back. Welcoming me back. Welcoming me back. And welcome you. To Tent Talks Tunes. Always good to have you on board. Alan Versapilis, who just posted a really raucous video of him doing a song called My God Can Beat Up Your God, originally recorded in 1984 by a little band called Broken Talent. Alan, or is it Alan? Please post a link to that video so the frantic fans and vibrational viewers of Tent talks, tunes, can experience your over-the-top version of the song that I wrote back in 1983 along with Big Santo, My God Can Beat Up Your God. It's always very flattering and humbling when people do their own versions of one of my songs. I get a big kick out of it, and it's really nice to know that, you know, a song that we just kind of I don't want to say bashed out, but we just kind of bashed it out because we were bored one afternoon in 1983. The better part of 40 years later, it's still got legs like ZZ Top. It's got legs and you know how to use them. So thank you, Alan, 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 however you pronounce your name, for covering My God Can Beat Up Your God. And um, yeah. So here's another hot topic. I'm sure you all saw this fantastic leather gauntlet. Handcrafted in Hattiesburg, Mississippi by my good friend and now bandmate, Mr. Walt Wheat. Walt, for those of you who might be paying attention or have seen Tent Talks Tunes in the past, you might know Walt as being the guitar player for the mighty before I Hang, who appeared within recent memory on a split 10-inch EP with, you guessed it, the Almighty Anti-Scene. Hope you guys can see that with all the reflection and the glare. And, uh, you know, showing what a small world it is and how irony always plays a hand in world events, Walt is now the guitar player for Anti-Scene. Yes, indeed he do. Our former guitar player, Mad Brother Ward, retired from music, leaving a big hole over there on stage right. But uh, Walt Wheat of Before I Hang, and now Anti-Scene, answered the call of duty when it was issued. And we actually just got done with our inaugural run of the Ultra lineup of Anti-Scene, featuring Walt on guitar, Featuring me wearing his handcrafted gauntlet. And also for Tent Talks Tunes, I'm wearing his handcrafted copper gauntlet that he made for me out of copper and magnets. Dating back to when this wrist was causing me incessant, relentless pain. And we thought it, thought it might have been um, arthritis. Turns out that my wrist had been broken. Um... But this is a darn good looking gauntlet. You know, Walt is a metalsmith, a leathersmith, a gunsmith, a guitar slinger, <clears throat> and an overall good dude. So if any of you people out there 
would like some fine leather craft or metal craft or gunsmithing, look him up. He's on my friends list. He's all over Facebook. He is the man. Thank you, Walt, for giving me this. So yeah, we did it. We took the Ultra lineup on the road and we played three nights in a row. First night at Reggie's in Wilmington, North Carolina with our pals the Street Clones and the Bastard Brigade. And as you can see by the backdrop, I've been collecting souvenirs the whole time. I love my souvenirs of playing live. We actually have here Honest to God handwritten set list by the Bastard Brigade. Honest to God handwritten set list by the Street Clones. I love this stuff. Love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. I got boxes of set lists that I've collected over the years. Going all the way back to 1983, 84-ish. And I love them. I, uh, every once in a while, I'll exhume one of those boxes and take a look at some of the set lists I've gotten. I should do a show and tell on Tent Talks Tunes about some of the crazy-ass set lists that I got. What do you guys think about that? Think that might be fun? Would you drink a toast of your local tap water to an episode of Tent Talks Tunes devoted to my set list collection? Let me know. Cast your vote. Click that thumbs up. Oh, I see some thumbs ups and hearts right there already. I think people kind of like the idea of a set list show. All right. We might have a, a future topic there. Of course, it means I got to dig them out. <laughs> oh, we just got a big old flurry, including at least one angry face. Who's the wiseacre who posted the angry face at the thought of a set list show? Hmm? Who are you, smart guy? I want to know. I think I'll be able to find out anyway, because I've discovered that if I if I look at Tent Talks Tunes as it's archived on my Facebook page, if I look at the comments as they appear in real time, the little picture icon of the person doing the posting will show before the uh, thing turns into a heart or a thumbs up, or in this case, a frowny face. Boy, oh boy. Some of my viewers out there have got a very salty sense of humor, I must say. But you know what? I kind of like it. Yeah, man, it was a dynamite run of shows. What else do we have here? We got a set list from our good pals Left On High, who we played with in Jacksonville, Florida. And uh, look at that, an anti-scene set list. Mm, yes, I am the type of guy to collect my own band's set lists. I'm just wacky that way. What can I tell you? It's part of the fun of being a rockin' and a roller. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. Great. As long as we're checking the bulletin board, we see we've got some set lists posted. What else is going on on the bulletin board here? Well, an event from the past, which I'm compelled to uh, mention. The Danbury Record and CD Expo. The Danbury Record and CD Expo, which took place on November 5th at the VFW Hall number 149 in Danbury. I co-promote it. I was not there this time because I was out on the road with Anti-Scene, but I was actually talking to uh, my co-promoter this morning, and uh, she said it was dynamite. Apparently a really good turnout, lots of happy dealers, which means by default, lots of happy shoppers, which means everybody happy. So thanks to all who came out to the event, thanks to all the dealers who set up and uh, helped get the people what they need in terms of records, tapes, CDs, collectibles, and yak, yak, yak. And we will be doing it again sometime in 2023, probably in the springtime. We haven't booked the date yet. But uh, yes, the Danbury Record and CD Expo is back. And by the way, if anybody out there is watching right now and attended the Danbury Record and CD Expo, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you got? Because one of my um, great joys, one of my great pleasures, <coughs> excuse me, in running the Expo is seeing who bought what. I love standing by my post by the front door and looking at people's purchases and talking to them about them because we just love vinyl. That, of course, is the nature of Tent Talks Tunes. So that was the past. What do we got to look forward into the future? The punk rock flea market. Yep, we're doing another one. December 10th of this year at a brand new venue, the State House in downtown New Haven, Connecticut by the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, by the, um, the Ninth Ward. If you guys know your ancient New Haven history, 
the State House, proudly located in the Ninth Ward on the same block as Cafe Nine. And if you've ever seen or played a show in New Haven, you know Cafe Nine. Um, new location because the old location proved to be a little bit problematic. Um, the punk rock flea market was so punk rock that it got shut down by the cops. Punk rock Maximus. Can you imagine that? And you might ask, well, what on earth could have been happening at a flea market to warrant it getting shut down by the cops? Well, what happened was so many people came out to the punk rock flea market that traffic was blocked for miles on the state highway in uh, Southington, where the, where the event was. It was held outdoor at a, an old drive-in theater. And traffic was blocked. Cars couldn't get through. So they had to send out, I don't, I don't know if they sent out the highway patrol or the local constabulary, but they had just to get traffic moving. And they had to block off the entrance and turn people away just so regular traffic could get through. That, my friends, is quite an accomplishment. So the State House, the new location, is indoors. It's weatherproof. There is ample parking, not only in the parking lot for the State House, but there's parking garages nearby, parking lots nearby, street parking all throughout the, the neighborhood in the city of New Haven. So parking should not be an issue. Travel should not be an issue. Attendance should not be an issue. So come on, get, come on down, gang. December 10th. December 10th at the State House in New Haven for the next Punk Rock Flea. And if you look on Facebook or the Hardcore Sweet Bakery website, you'll see all the information that you need about it. I will be set up. I will have a table full of vinyl and cassettes and CDs, including, by great popular demand, the newest and latest anti-scene vinyl release the 7 inch 45 RPM single of Are You Sure Hank Done It That Way yes anti-scene covers Waylon Jennings and we do it in the way that only we do it look at that grisly bunch of nasty weathered old rock and rollers posing hard for you including that guy right there. Look at him. Look at that dude. Look at him scowling at you from the back of that record cover. I will have a couple of these. Only 300 pressed on black. I got a couple of them. There's also a very limited number of pink vinyl copies on bright, shocking, opaque pink that you can get on antiscene.com. Only a hundred of those. And there was also a lime green, a translucent lime green pressing that was only available from TKO Records, our label. Not sure if those are still available, but it couldn't hurt to go over to TKO and take a look. And it certainly couldn't hurt to go to Anticene.com and take another good, long look. I will, of course, also have a wide selection of Anticene vinyl, including the latest LP, Live from Quarantine 2, featuring, uh, you guessed it again, that, that rather severe-looking bass player. Yep. I will have it all for you. So thank you, everybody, from the past and on behalf of the future. Um, no mail this week, simply because um, uh, another one of those things that people know me for is my car troubles. Uh, my once-beloved 2008 Subaru... Uh, has a seized up engine. Don't know if it's going to survive, but because of that, I have not been on the road checking the mailbox. So we've checked the bulletin board. Can't check the mailbox just yet. We will soon enough. So let's get right down to the brass tacks of Tent Talks Tunes, which is all stuff that I have found on the road during my last run with anti scene. I found stuff not only on the gigs, but also at all the record stores that I go to. I think it bears repeating that when I go on tour, either as a solo, doing my solo acoustic or solo electric hardcore, or with Anti-Scene, or Ultra Money, or They Hate Us, 
or the Bloody Apostles, what I like to do is hit all the record stores in the towns that I stop in. And I always have a bunch of stuff from my label, TPOS. And I will, well, actually, I can kind of demonstrate what it's like for you. I got a big old crate of vinyl. This is actually a short crate of vinyl. But I walk in with a big old crate of vinyl filled with TPOS product. Hate that word, but product. And I will walk in and go to the person behind the counter and say, hello, person behind the counter. My name is Malcolm Tent, and I have a label called TPOS. I specialize in weirdo degenerate outsider stuff. Would you like to buy some of my stuff? And if they have even one whit of common sense, and I'm happy to report that most of them do, every once in a while, every once in a great while, I will actually walk into a record store and there will be somebody behind the counter who, let's be charitable. Let's just say that they are ignorant of the facts because that leaves them hope. That leaves them hope to educate themselves. But every once in a while, we find someone behind the counter who is ignorant of the facts and is not interested in my stuff. Fine. The overwhelming majority of people behind the counter at record stores want my stuff. And when they want my stuff, I always tell them, man, occasionally woman, don't give me the money yet. Because if you give me the money, it's just going to disappear into my pocket. And I'll walk out with money, which is, of course, fantastic, because money does make the world go round. But let me look through your bins first. Let me see what you got in there. And I'll take a little trade. And that's how I end up with some really damn cool stuff to bring back for you people to show and tell and quite often to sell at fine events like the Punk Rock Holiday Flea on December 10th or via my Discogs and eBay pages. So I'm going to talk about things here that uh, I think I'm actually going to keep all of these for myself uh, just because it's one of those days, you know. Uh, no, you know what? I'll take that back. I got one or two that I am willing to sell on this one, but uh, the majority the majority of these are keepers. First of all, I got to thank Jeff Clayton for this one. Jeff Clayton, the unimpeachable president for life and lead singer of the almighty anti-scene. He's got his own program on Tuesdays called Break On Through. And Jeff does a lot of what I do. He talks about music geekery and nerdery. He also talks about movies, and he has a top 10 list, and just fun stuff relating to our culture. By necessity, it's quite often anti-scene-centric, but he goes way afield. Like yesterday, he, he did a top 10 of his favorite war movies, and <laughs> it was pretty neat. There were some I'd never heard of before, a few that I had seen myself, and uh, it was very, very entertaining. I really enjoyed it. So look up Break On Through every Tuesday on the Anti-Scene Facebook page or on the Anti-Scene YouTube page. It's because of Jeff and his Break On Through that I learned about this. Found it on 8-Track Baby, The Great Insult. Featuring Wild Man Steve and Gene Tracy. This is like the best of all possible worlds. This came out, I'm going to guess, sometime in the 1970s. You've got a dirty white comic and a dirty black comic. At a Holiday Inn, just having a cutting contest. Playing the dozens on each other and riffing off each other. And this is some of the fun... It's like I've said before, I'm not, I've never really been a big fan of dirty humor because so often it's not done right. It's just dumb and nasty for the sake of being filthy. But these two dudes know how to do it right. And they just completely go at it with each other. And it is hilarious. And so to find it on 8-track, sealed? Sealed 8-track, kids. And I don't know if you can tell, but the 8-track actually has custom art. Custom cartoon art. Which is very funny. And on the back, it says, save this carton for hard times. Wink, wink, wink. 
I guess this is supposed to provide you with relief during those hard times by looking at the uh, the cartoon on it. Rated triple X, strictly adults only. Sale of this tape prohibited to anyone under 18 years of age. If anything on this tape reminds you of anyone you know, then you know the wrong people. Signed, Stereo Joe. You got your disclaimer right there. That's that's like the 1970s equivalent of a parental advisory sticker. Yeah, I am probably going to have to crack this one open because I've searched for it on YouTube and all I could ever find was a very short excerpt. This is the whole thing. I'm going to pop this sucker into my 8-track player and digitize it and have it on CD, baby. So I can pollute my mind and the local airwaves some more. Mm. Let's have a, let's drink a deep, dark toast of Danbury tap to dirty truck stop humor as found on eight track cartridges. <clears throat> Talk about niche. That's about as niche as it gets. What do you say, Murray Gelman, tuning in from Tucson, Arizona? What's your opinion of that stuff? I love it. All right, now here's another. This is a, a choice find, choice find. By the way, I got that Gene Tracy Wildman Steve 8-track at Repo Record in Charlotte, North Carolina. On my way home, I visited another fine store that I've been wanting to get to for a very long time, Double Decker Records in Allentown, Pennsylvania. I've known Jamie, who owns that place since, I think, before he owned it. Actually, he's a, he's an old hardcore punk rock dude, always a record collector. And he opened up a shop in Allentown. Uh, I think he told me it was 20, 20 odd years ago. And I still hadn't ever been there before. But finally, I set foot into Double Decker Records in Allentown. He bought a big old pile of my TPOS product, including lots of anti-scene records. So if you guys want to get some anti-scene, all of the stores I'm about to mention or have mentioned do stock anti-scene vinyl, along with Charles Manson, Gigi Allen, Reverend Jim Jones, Tiny Tim, and in some instances, even my album. So Double Decker Records in Allenton, Allentown, Pennsylvania, man, they found a record that I've already got a copy of in my personal collection. So this one is up for grabs. And this is the kind of record I love. Love. Let's go back in time a little bit to 1972. David Bowie is the hottest thing on wheels. He's selling records. He's selling tickets. Part of the reason being that he was completely, utterly outrageous. David Bowie is one of the most outrageous performers of his day. You cannot even imagine how controversial and uh, schismatic and polarizing he was. So, big news, big deal, David Bowie. Of course, he made the biggest waves by going public and saying, I'm gay! So here you've got this guy, huge sell out concerts, selling tons of records, who is essentially a gay mutant outer space man. So of course, that triggered a whole wave of gay mutant outer space people who wanted to make records and be David Bowie. And, you know, the definitions are pretty loose. You could say that Lou Reed, Iggy Pop, Mott the Hoople, they certainly read the they certainly rode the crest of that wave. I don't think any one of them actually tried to pass themselves off as a gay mutant outer space man, but they definitely caught that vibe. You know, I mean, Iggy and Lou, they went went out with plenty of face makeup and plenty of glitter and plenty of eyeliner. You know, they were playing the game. Even the Mick Jagger, the Rolling Stones. Jagger especially went out with lots of glitter and eyeliner and makeup. And so did a whole other of people who had a completely different set of skills. 
then David Bowie, Lou Reed, and Mott the Hoople. One of my favorites, one of my absolute favorites is this guy right here. And this, this is just the warm up to the record I found in uh, Allentown. One of my favorites, I've talked about this dude before on Tent Talks, Tunes, Joe Bryath. Joe Bryath was probably the first, and I would venture to say only one of the gay mutant outer space men who even came close to making a dent on the charts. And mind you, it was only a dent, and it was um, more of a, a near miss than an actual hit. Here's his second album. He's the only one I know of who made more than one album. They were both on Elektra Records. Check that out. Creatures of the Street by Joe Bryath. Look at that. Look at that outer space mutant gay guy. Oh, boy. Yes, indeed. As I mentioned earlier, his skill set was slightly different than David Bowie's. I mean, some people could be unkind and say that it was sorely lacking. I try not to be unkind. I give everybody the benefit of the doubt and I give everybody big fat credit for doing what they do. You know, this guy actually got it together to make two albums, to write and record two albums and go on tour. Um, the stuff's out there. You can definitely hear it on YouTube. There's some live clips of this guy on YouTube that just defy description. You gotta see him. So, yeah, he tried to hitch his wagon to David Bowie's gay mutant outer space rocket ship. And he might have come close to kind of sort of making it almost maybe just a little bit sort of, but not quite. He was the biggest. He might have been the best. Speaking of biggest and best, I got to take a moment here to introduce your favorite, probably heterosexual, firmly rooted on planet Earth. Feline, fine, furry-faced, ferocious, fangy, yet somehow friendly friend of mine, Harry the Cat. Here you go, guys. You don't get to see, don't get to see Harry on camera too often, but here he is, my little boy. You don't get to see me getting all cuddly and mushy too much either very often, but I'm going to do it now. Who's my boy? Say hi to the people, Harry. You are live on the internet right now and also archived forever on YouTube and archived forever on Facebook. Yep, you're getting hearts and loves and smileys. My guy. I'm going to be terrible. I'm going to make you wave. Hi, hi. Yeah, this is when Harry wants to get out. Park on the park on my lair. Park on my lap there. You know, just stay right there. He's out of... Oh, no. Now he's got to go away because he wants to hog the camera. Harry... Love you, guy. Gotta leave ya. Go kill a mouse or something. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, I am vegan, but I understand the laws of nature. That guy is a champion mouser. And uh, in fact, just a couple of days ago, I uh, woke up and found a lovely, fresh killed mouse right there on my bedroom doorstep. He left it for me as a gift. Is that love or what? Harry, you're beautiful. I love you. So who else is beautiful that I love? Outer space mutant gay man? Dorian. There he is. Dorian himself from New York City. That's the front. And that's the back. There's a picture of Dorian himself. Well, let's see if I can get the proportions right on this. No, nope. I'm still sort of getting used to the way the camera focuses and which direction is which. There he is. There's Dorian. I first heard of Dorian in the pages of Punk magazine. John Holmstrom and Legs McNeil's magazine, Punk. The way that they interviewed people in Punk magazine was just classic. And the Dorian interview is a great example of it. They opened up the article by saying, we got a phone call from this guy 
who managed an artist called Dorian, they said, the guy said that he would take us out to a steak dinner with Dorian if we would interview him and publish it in Punk Magazine. So they, they prefaced it right away with saying that they, there was a steak dinner in it for them. So they said, okay, we went out to a steak dinner and we interviewed this guy. And then they, pr then they printed the interview verbatim. And if I recall correctly, at least part of it was cartoon. And it's the funniest damn thing you've ever read. I don't know if it's posted online anywhere or if any of you guys out there have original issues of Punk Magazine. But yeah, the, the Punk Magazine interview with Dorian. Fantastic. I did some research on Dorian a, a few years ago when I first found my first copy of this record. And people basically described him as a poor little rich boy who just wanted so badly to be a rock star. And um, I guess this was his first attempt. It's an independent label. Let's see if you can see that. Amarama Records. And I believe this is the only thing that Amarama ever released. Don't quote me on that, but I think it was. And uh, yeah, self-financed, independent, full-length LP of mutant gay space rock. Done with a... I'll say it again, with a rather uh, unique skill set and a very interesting way of expressing himself. Luckily, there's uh, lyrics on the back. Uh, first track, The Men's Room. Did you ever feel your mother's broom? Did you ever feel your old man's gloom? I, I could go on, but I'm not gonna. With an opening line like that, how can you go wrong? Did you ever feel your mother's broom? Man, that's deep. That's deep. That's Dorian. I think maybe my favorite track on here is Side 2, Cut 2. It's called Silver Stringed Marionette. Nine minutes and 25 seconds of vaguely homoerotic lyrics about, well, let's see, Howdy Doody is name-checked in there. Uh, Kukla Fran and Ollie are name-checked in there. Uh, Rudy Kazooty, whoever that is, is named in there. Nine minutes and 25 seconds of songs about his uh, silver-stringed marionette, his beautiful little wooden pet. Wow. And of course, on the back, there's the credit, the thank you list. I have no one to thank for this album but myself. Can you read it? Can you see it? He's got no one to thank for this whole thing but himself. Well, I say thank you, Dorian, for recording one of the wackiest, weirdest albums of a super niche and very short-lived genre that I've ever heard. I mean, you hear me talk about niche. How niche can you get? Homosexual outer space mutant rock and roll. There should have been a lot more as far as I'm concerned, but uh, Joe Bryath and Dorian, they're really the only ones I know about. You might throw early John Cougar in there before he was, you know, John Mellencamp. He had his fair share of makeup and eyeliner and he was on David Bowie's label. Still saying about the same old stuff, you know, middle American pink houses and whatnot, but boy, was he pretty back then. Apparently he hated that image, but the evidence survives to this day. His first two albums. Yep. Yep. Maybe not outer space, maybe not gay, maybe not mutant, but definitely glam. Glam, I'm telling you. Of course, kind of the same deal. If anybody out there is aware of anybody else who tried to ride the tidal wave of David Bowie's popularity, 
please post links. I love to dis I love to discover this kind of stuff. The more obscure, the better. I just love it. It's that side of showbiz that, you know, this kind of stuff will never, ever, ever be written about in Rolling Stone. Dorian will never, ever, ever be nominated to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Joe Bryath is not going to be, uh, you know, you're not going to find a Joe Bryath record at Walmart, you know, the exclusive colored vinyl Joe Bryath record, Walmart. It's never going to happen. That's why I love these people, not only because they're damn weird and bizarre and wonderful, but because no one knows them. It just makes it that much more fun. Nobody knows them. That's the fun of it. That's where the real thrill of discovery comes in. That's what keeps me going. All right. Got this one in the town of Hickory, North Carolina, which uh, the people in Concord tell me you got to say it like this. Hickory. Crate Diggers Records in Hickory, North Carolina. I scored some real good stuff there. Not the least of which. Oh boy, I'm starting to salivate at the very thought of this one. I got it here in my lap. I can't wait to show it to you people. You've heard me talk a lot on Tent Talks Tunes about my love, my adoration, my worship of sleazy, cheesy, completely cynical exploitation and cash-in records. Records that were not made to be art. Records that were not made to stand the test of time. Records that were not meant to be critically analyzed. Records that were made for one reason and one reason only. And that was to grab as much cash from a current fr a current trend as quickly as possible and then throw it away and move on to the next one pure money making motivation it's the only reason these records exist and once again if you go onto my youtube channel and look up tent talks tunes you'll find i've done one entire episode to these wonderful exploitation records specifically the Beatles exploitation records of the early 1960s. But the genre is pretty wide ranging. It's pretty wide and it's pretty deep. Any sort of music that even briefly made waves was up for grabs for these people. And the way that these records would be made, and you know, please bear with me if you've heard the explanation before, but I think it bears repeating because it's so much fun. Um, typically, some cigar-chomping wannabe executive in a place like Long Island, New York, would pick up uh, the latest issue of Variety magazine or Billboard magazine and say, hmm, what's happening these days? Um, oh, I see. Uh, sitar music. Yes, uh, sitar music. This guy, Ravi Shanker. All right, he's kind of popular. Uh, George Harrison, he's a Beatle. He likes sitars. Um, okay, well, we need a sitar album. So he'd call downstairs and say, all right, guys, get it together. I need a sitar. I need an album of sitar music by the end of the day. Get to it. Hang up the phone. And by the end of the day, he would have a sitar album, a full-length album of sitar music. Maybe not full-length. These things usually clock in at about 10 songs per album. And the songs are usually two or three minutes each. So they're, they're pretty short, you know. And they were meant for sale only at drugstores, dime stores, thrift shops, um, the bargain bins of record stores. Um, anywhere that a, a guy known as a rack jobber could travel door to door and convince a place to put a little floor space aside and have a rack of these records. I remember very clearly that the, the drugstore in my grandma's neighborhood had one. The drugstore in my neighborhood had one. The dime store in my grandma's neighborhood had one. It was like a wire rack, you know, about as tall as a person with like say four shallow wire display things. It would be stocked 
with these cheap ass records like Flower Power Sitar. Look at that psychedelic artwork masterpiece. Flower Power Sitar by Rajput and the Sepoy Mutiny. <laughs> With incredible song titles. This had to have been 1967. Dig the song titles. Flower Power, Flower Bed, Ice String Beads, Do It With Flowers, Lullaby for Flower Children, Child of Love, Ragadelic, Flowers, Flowers Everywhere, Beautiful, Beautiful Flower, <laughs> and the Fifth Dimension hit, Up, Up, and Away. Now you might ask, how did the cigar chomper on the second floor make a phone call to the basement and get a full-length album done by the end of the business day? Well, it's quite easy, actually. You would have these musicians downstairs who would rush out to the record store and get a phonograph copy of, say, Up, Up, and Away by The Fifth Dimension. They would put it on the record player downstairs, listen to it a couple of times, figure out how to play it, start the tape recorder, and then play it. Hit stop. And in this case, they would have... <laughs> By the sounds of this record, they would have also gone to the local music shop on Long Island and bought themselves a sitar and then sat down and played the sitar along with this one take, no redos, one take wonder version of Up, Up, and Away. And then they would typically like maybe record a couple of generic instrumental tracks just like real simple, you know, moon, June, spoon type music, and then overdub some more sitar on it. And then they would go into their library where they had dozens and dozens and dozens of tapes of this generic instrumental stuff recorded in years gone by. Like you'd have a bunch of twist numbers from when the twist was a big craze. You'd have a bunch of surf, you know, surf, quote unquote, songs from when surf music was a craze. They would get those instrumental recordings, play them back, and this guy who had just bought a sitar 15 minutes ago would play sitar on top of these instrumental tracks. And hence, you've got a, a brand new song called Beautiful, Beautiful Flowers that they can put on this Flower Power Sitar record by Rajput and the Sepoy Mutiny. Un believable. And I, my brothers and sisters, all of you out there who are watching and listening right now, I'm not joking. I'm not lying. I'm telling you exactly what I heard when I played this record. Side one, track one, is that version of Up, Up, and Away. Featuring, I'm not joking, the worst. The worst ever-loving, gall-dang, mother-scratching, chicken-bashing sitar player I've ever heard in my life. It is very, very obvious that whoever's playing the sitar, whoever this uh, Raj Put guy is, really probably had only owned a sitar or maybe he was renting a sitar for the afternoon, but it only ever had it in his hands for five or 10 minutes. I'm not joking. It is completely out of tune, completely out of key. And you can hear the dude fumbling while he plays. There's like all these dropped notes and awkward pick hits. And, you know, at least one place where he kind of gets lost. But that was the nature of these things. One take. The big boss wanted this record done by the end of the day. So that's it. One take. And it was only going to be sold at a dime store anyway for 88 cents. So who cared? You know, nobody cared. They just pressed it and got it out. And then the next day they were going to record maybe, um, 
I don't know, a, a Hare Krishna tribute record. I wouldn't be surprised. It was like whatever they thought they could cash in on as quickly as possible. And this is such a wonderful, wonderful example of that extremely cynical business model. This record is terrible. What's interesting is that as the album goes on from track one, side one, to track five, side two, the sitar player actually gets a little bit better. I mean, he never gets good, mind you. There is no good sitar playing on this record. But you can actually hear the guy sort of getting better from one track to the other. He, he is learning on the job, on vinyl, forever. So yes, Rajput and the Sepoy Mutiny. Not a record that anybody in their right mind would ever want or listen to, but I never said I was in my right mind. I never made any claims to the contrary. I only said that my name is Malcolm Tent, and I love to talk tunes. And I have always had a big fondness in my heart for the records that nobody else wants. Because there's always a reason why nobody wants them. And those reasons usually appeal to my sense of the absurd. Absurd. By the way, this album is on the wonderful cheese ball exploitation record design. Design was a subsidiary of Pickwick Records of Long Island. Lou Reed, to name one, actually cut his teeth as an in-house singer-songwriter for Design Records. You can actually hear his voice and his guitar playing on some of these records if you have sharp enough hearing. I have a few of those for sale, by the way. If anybody wants to hear some Lou Reed before he was Lou Reed, hit me up. I'll hook you up. I forgot to mention, too, that this Dorian record... This Dorian record, this copy of this Dorian record is for sale. So if you want some genuine homosexual, outer space, mutant rock and roll on an independent label by a guy who was mocked mercilessly in punk magazine, let me know. I got it for you. You might not know you need it, but you do need it. All right, what else did I find here? Oh, my God, here's another one. This is great. Oh, my eyes lit up when I saw this thing. You don't even know how happy this one made me. You don't even know. I don't have words to describe the joy in my heart when I picked this one out of the bin I gotta remember which shop was I at when I got this one. My memory serves me badly right now. It was in the, what is the town that James Madison University is in? Noble Records was the name of the shop. Noble Records in Martinsburg, Virginia. Yes, at the beginning of the trip. Now you guys, if you're a follower of Tent Talks Tunes, you've heard me talk a lot about Grand Funk. You might have heard me do my entire show devoted to their manager, Terry Knight. Hell of a story. It's the kind of stuff you can't make up. The story of Terry Knight. I was waxing rhapsodic about Terry Knight's post-Grand Funk career when he started to believe his own hype. When he actually genuinely believed that he could, uh, to paraphrase him, take a lump of shit and make gold out of it. He genuinely believed that he had this magical ability to create something out of nothing. And, um, you know, to, to cut to the chase, the first band that he attempted to do this with was a group called Mom's Apple Pie. And the very infamous story about it is how he came up with this pornographic album cover and tried to generate a lot of controversy about it. Thinking that with enough controversy, there'd be enough sales. And with enough sales, you know, superstardom. And he, he would have created himself another Grand Funk Railroad. As we all know, didn't quite work. And um, 
the, the I think pretty sure one of the last pieces of the Terry Knight puzzle was a copy of that original Mom's Apple Pie record. I found it. I found it at Noble Records in Martinsburg, Virginia. And of course, you know, I do have a bit of a sense of propriety here, so I'm not going to show you the naughty bits. You can certainly find them online. Maybe you're one of the unlucky people who actually has this in your personal record collection. I don't know. But here is the Mom's Apple Pie record in question. I have censored it with my fingers, which are very carefully, strategically placed. Yes, Mom's Apple Pie with the dirty cover. That's the dirty cover. And that's Mom's Apple Pie themselves. Apparently, at least one of the members of Mom's Apple Pie was extremely embarrassed by the front cover. And the music itself, well, my good friend and, and mentor Leslie Wimmer of Open Books and Records was visiting me the last time I found a Mom's Apple Pie record in the wild. And I was playing for it, playing it just to listen to it. And she looked up and said, you know what? This, this record sounds very common. And I thought that was an apt description. It's very common. Uh, Mom's Apple Pie were not the worst band in the world, but kind of like guys like Joe Bryath and Dorian, they were trying to jump on a type of music that was very popular at a specific moment in time, and that was horn-driven rock bands. This is in the days when Blood, Sweat, and Tears and Chicago were selling boatloads of records, and each band had a big horn section. So, lo and behold, you got this band. I think they're from Ohio, I want to say. Lo and behold, you got, uh, you know, 13 or 14 guys who put together a band with a great big horn section, and they're going to ride the crest of the wave of blood, sweat, and tears in Chicago. And, you know, it's okay. It's, it's not bad. It's just kind of, you know, it's just really nothing too special about it. I even found a bootleg recording of these guys on the uh, Wolf, Wolfgang's Vault website. And, you know, to me, the litmus test of whether a band is really kick-ass or not is, can they do it live? And I've been turned on to a lot of great music by listening to a live album or a live bootleg of a band. And I've also done an episode of Tent Talks Tunes about that. So I checked out this live recording of Mom's Apple Pie, thinking, well, maybe they could fire it up live, and, you know, maybe there's something that just didn't get captured on vinyl. Hate to say it, but the uh, live recording was about as common as the LP. Sorry, guys. I tried. I really did. But I just did not hear anything that uh, would make Terry Knight sell millions and millions and millions of records. And, of course, it didn't happen. So, I don't know. The results speak for themselves. Now, I'm going to wrap up here with another record that I found. I believe I found this one. Uh, let me try to remember what my itinerary was for this whole trip. I went to so many record stores. This one was from um, Main Street Jukebox in Stroudsburg. Main Street Records in Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania. Great shop. And uh, digging through the cheap $1 records, I found a cheap $1 record by a band who I genuinely love. Um, a band that never got the recognition that they really deserved, kind of like Grand Funk. Um, sold millions and millions of records. I'm pretty sure they're not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I'm pretty sure they were never on the color of Rolling Stone. I'm pretty sure that they never won a Grammy. Pretty sure that they never got any of the kudos that money can buy. I'm talking about Three Dog Night. Harmony. I'm here to tell you right now, my droogies, this is a great record. This is a seriously, really, really good record. Three Dog Night knew their shiznit. They knew how to make a record that totally rocked. Uh, when I was a wee lad, my father had Three Dog Night captured live at the forum on 8-track tape. And he would play that 8-track tape a lot. And... Boom. I loved that. Loved it. And then uh, later on, you know, through the household was the Three Dog Night, It Ain't Easy album, the One album, 
um, Around the World with Three Dog Night, uh, The Joy to the World Greatest Hits, Golden Biscuits, the first Three Dog Night Greatest Hits, Golden Biscuits. Those records really blew me away when I was a kid. And as is so often the case with bands that I really liked when I was young, I just, you know, kind of lost track of them for a while and didn't really think about it until one day I just sort of came across a copy of Three Dog Night Live at the Forum and said, eh, why don't I play this for the first time in 30 years? And I did, and it was just as good as I remembered it. It was really, really that good. And that set me off on my path to just start rebuilding my Three Dog Night collection. And, you know, because of the reasons I mentioned before, they were never on the cover of Rolling Stone. They never got a Grammy. They were never in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. They don't have a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, probably. Just because their management didn't have enough clout to buy them all of those accolades, they've always stayed very well under the radar. And I can practically guarantee you that if you go to any cheap bin in any record store, or if you look hard enough at any flea market or yard sale, you, you will find all the Three Dog Night records you want cheap. I got this for a buck. It's hardly in any kind of great condition, you know, the cover's all split and worn out. But for a buck, why not? Brought it home, played it. Damn good record. Real good combination of mellow 70s groove and some tasty 70s rock music. So, Three Dog Night. I've been an unrepentant fan for uh, the better part of my entire life. And I was just very happy to find this cheap beater copy that I can just play whenever I feel like it. You know, it's the kind of record that I don't have to put in a plastic bag. Um, even, I mean, I'm not the type of guy to grab a record like this and put my fingers all over the wax. But if I were gonna, this would be one of those records. Got nothing to lose. If I destroy it, I'll find another one for a buck somewhere. Who cares? But a great record, seriously. If anybody out there likes tasty 70s rock, we can talk about Three Dog Night all day long. Boom. And that, my friends, wraps up this week's episode of Tent Talks Tunes. Between the fact that my touring schedule is over for the year and that my Sub has got a seized engine, I ain't going anywhere for a while. I plan to be staying very well put at least until January, um, with the exception of going to the Punk Rock Holiday Flea on December 10th, which means we should have lots of Tent Talks tunes for the next couple of months. I don't think I'll be missing any. You know, I can't predict the future, obviously, but should be good. So I should be seeing a lot more of you than I have in the past few weeks. If you're watching on YouTube, thank you for watching. As fun as it is here on YouTube, it's triply fun live on Facebook every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And I'm going to sign off now with something I didn't talk about as I go to my monitor and see if I can turn this thing off successfully. One of my favorite magazines of all time, after Cream Magazine and before Maximum Rock and Roll, there was Trouser Press. And I do believe I'll be talking about Trouser Press next week and some of the music I found in the field that does relate to Trouser Press. So I do hope to be back in about 167 hours. Until we meet again, this is Malcolm Tent saying so long from the Nutmeg State. <laughs>